fantastic. Well, let me get into the Word this morning. Are you ready for that? We are launching a series. It's our As You Go series. And this year, uh, our series is called The Pursuit of Justice. You know, when I look over my life, one of the things that I'm most grateful for is that I grew up in an environment, and particularly in my teenage years of youth ministry environments, where I was constantly told that God has a plan for my life. Just about every youth camp I ever went to, you can guarantee it, it included a message that came from Jeremiah 2911. And the New Testament kind of expression of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, they were both coupled in together. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. And he says they are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. That was spoken so many times that it went deep into my mind, into my soul and into my thinking. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. Why? So that we can do the good things that he has planned for us long ago. I tell you this morning, the narrative of my teenage years, as far as being in any kind of gospel environment or church environment, is that God has a good plan for me. And I want you to know that this morning, church, that God has a good plan for your life. I heard that message so many times growing up that I believed it. And I believed it, then because I believed it, I did what I think everyone else did. And that is, I asked the obvious question. God, what is your good plan for me? And the desire when you ask God that question is that he would audibly speak to you and say, well, my cherished son, Here is what I lay before thee and how you are going to... I don't know why God speaks old language when I I don't, but it makes him sound regal. You will do this and this. And not only has that not been my experience, I have never met one person who tells me that says, you know, in fact, I think one of the most frequently asked questions of heaven is, God, what is your good plan for me? If heaven had a web page on the FAQs, frequently asked questions, there would just be a, you know, a, 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 just a question that everyone asks is, so we're just going to put a script here and you can all read it. If God, what's your plan for me is definitely one of those questions. Now, everyone that gets told that God's got a good plan for them is just desperate to know that. And its motivation for that is very healthy. is to say, well, God, if you've got a plan for me, I want to outwork it. I want to live in the plan and the purpose that you have for me. You know, as you're growing up as a teenager and maybe don't quite have the maturity of faith that comes as you continue to walk with God, this begins as a blessing, but friend, it can become a burden. As you become someone who is excited that God has a good plan for you to being someone who lives under the burden of not wanting to get it wrong. Oh, what if I do? What if I go here, but God wanted me to go there? What if I wear a black shirt, but God wanted me to wear a blue one? You you go to conferences and and you hear miracle stories like, you know, someone walked into the building and they said, All right, God, I don't believe in you, but if the preacher's wearing a checkered shirt today, I will. And guess what? The preacher was. The pressure. Am I wearing the right shirt? For the voice of God spoken to someone. You know, I was recently in a, in a conversation, not directly about this, but surrounding this with one of my mentors and actually a mentor of Lifehouse in the space of mission. And uh, you guys know him. His name's Jack Haynes. And I was asking him just about stuff like this. And we were talking about God's good plan. And he, he said something to me that was so profound that it has completely changed my entire perspective of the pursuit of God's plan for my life. Jack said this. He said, Lottie, most people are asking God, what is your plan for my life? 
I said, I agree. That's the same question I've asked a thousand times. He then said, the problem is this question is flawed. So he has my attention because I've asked and I'm sure we all have. He says, it's a flawed question. I lean in. I'm saying, Jack, why is it a flawed question? He said, well, not through people's intention, but this becomes a flawed question because it somehow puts our life at the centre and we are never intended to be at the centre. I'm listening, I'm going, okay, explain more. He says, Lottie, you don't have to ask God what his plan is for your life. All you have to ask God is, what is your plan? Because the moment you discover what God's plan is, friend, you don't need an audible voice telling you what to do. All you need to do is look at what gift God has given you. What talent is yours, what resources you might have, and then with the free will that he's given you, simply get on board. You have the freedom to do whatever you wish. You know, Paul in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Friend, he's not saying that his body has been overtaken by a master puppeteer and now it just moves in whatever. No, no. Jesus himself came to a point where he had to lay down his own will to align with the will of the Father. The great gift of God putting the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden is to say the people who follow me will always be the people who do it by choice. And in the freedom that God has given us today, we don't have to be burdened in any sense by a perfect plan that we think God needs to have for us or reveal to us. We don't need that. All we need to know is, God, which direction are you going? Because that's the direction I want to go. And with whatever you've put in my hand, I'm going to use it to see that go forward. God, what is your plan for me? You know, the Bible calls us co-laborers. It means God's doing the work and we are choosing to get on board. He is going to fulfill what he plans to do on this earth. It's our freedom to decide what part we are going to play. What gift is in your hand today? What talent is in your hand? What resource is in your hand? It is your free will to use that to uh, make your career go forward. And there's nothing wrong with the career. That's one of the things that God will use. It's a testimony. Your finances is another part of that. It's a testimony. And God says, I'll put it in your hand. You use it to see my kingdom go forward. Now, this excites me because I now go, well, I'm not going to ask the question anymore. God, what's your plan for me? I'm going to ask the question, God, what's your plan? And thankfully that right throughout God's word, he has revealed his plan over and over and over again. I've chosen for this series to draw out God's plan for humanity from Micah chapter 6. And it's the reason why I've chosen it is because it's succinct, it's understandable, and I'm confident that we will not only be able to apply it, but we will remember it all our days. So let me read to you the overarching scripture that will be coming through for this series for the next five weeks. And it's from Micah chapter 6, where God is, or or, or a conversation is being had with God, and a question is being asked about what does God want from me? And so it said, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Should I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the The Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil. Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? You know, all of these questions are very specific. What does God want from me questions? Does God want me to do this or does God want me to do that? If I find out, I'll make that the pursuit of my life. Gee, I hope I get it right. And into this tension comes the response that has the power to set our entire life, no matter what age we are at, on the course that God has for each one of us. It's famously known. It's in Micah 6, 8, and it says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. Jeremiah 29, 11. Ephesians 2, 10, 
talks about the good plan. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? What is your part to play? Here it is, to act justly. In the ESV, it literally says to do justice, to act justly, to do justice, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Friends, I love this scripture so much because it is so succinct and it is so simple. Here through the prophet Micah, God reveals what his plan is for humanity. And that is that our lives would be lived doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with our God. And this is obviously the passage that we take our scripture for this series, which is called The Pursuit of Justice. Now, over the next five weeks, we're going to really draw out what the pursuit of justice looks like 2,000 years after Jesus was on this earth and many more years since this prophecy was declared. And, And so we're going to do that. But before we get to the doing of justice, we have to recognize that these three frameworks that God has given for his plan being outworked are not chronological, meaning we don't go after the doing of justice so that we can fall in love with mercy, so that we can walk humbly with God. It's actually reversed. They are in ascending order of importance. And so we can just flip them around to get the understanding that the most powerful way to live a life of justice is by walking humbly with God. Because if you live a life of the pursuit of, oh sorry, of walking in humility with God, you will fall in love with the mercy that He has given you. And when you love the mercy that He he has given you, it becomes easy to desire to outwork that for others. You know, if God's plan for my life is that on this earth I would do justice, then I can... Live with the understanding, well, if I'm going to do that, then I've got to go the steps before that and answer the question, what does it mean to walk humbly with God? And as we launch our series this morning, this is the foundation that each of us must move from. Do you know Psalm 97, And Tristan, I think I had this as one of the last slides. Psalm 97 says this, The foundation of God's throne are righteousness and justice. Now, what's interesting about this is that the word righteous could be described by the phrase, to be made right. What's also interesting is the word justice can be described as to make things right. Now, here's the interesting thing with those two phrases. One of them, God gives you no responsibility for outworking. Friend, you can do nothing to make yourself right. Your righteousness is entirely on Him. So God says, I will make you right so that you can make things right. And don't go bothering to try and make things right before you're made right because things that aren't right can't make things right. The foundation of God's throne. What does that mean? It means the outgoing of God's kingdom is the revelation that when he makes me right, I am then empowered to make things right or as he intends them to be. Not made right for me, made as he intends them to be. You know, the the revelation then of righteousness comes into question and and, uh, I'm going to take you to a story this morning that I think, in the New Testament, gives us the best picture that I can draw out of what it means to walk humbly with God. You can read this whole passage from Luke chapter 7, verse 36 to 50. I'm not going to read it in its entirety entirety this morning, but I'm going to paraphrase the story for you. You see, this scripture or this story that takes place, it's not a parable, it's an actual event. And in this story, there are two main characters There is a Pharisee named Simon. And scholars will tell you that this is the same Simon that received his healing from God from leprosy. 
And then there is another person, and this woman in the story is not even named. She's only identified as an immoral woman. They're the two main characters. So Jesus goes into the house of Simon at Simon's request and is having a meal there. And the way that they ate a meal was not the way we do, uh, sitting, you know, at our table with our plate in front of us. They reclined, and the Scripture actually says that. Jesus was reclining, so he's laying down and having his meal and everyone sort of around there having their meal together. And somehow this woman sneaks into the house, gets her way in, And she makes her way to the feet of Jesus. And it's there that she breaks open an expensive jar of perfume. Probably the most only precious thing that she had. Or maybe the result of her entire life saving. That's the narrative that we're supposed to draw from the story. She took her most precious thing. She broke it open, poured it out over Jesus. And in a state of absolute weeping, she poured out, undid her hair, which was a powerful thing in that, in that time that that was all supposed to be covered. She unraveled her hair and wept at the feet of Jesus and washed his feet with her hair. Friend, I just want to say to you this morning that in my own personal, this is just a very, very personal thing that I'm saying to you, I can't find, for me personally, a more raw act of worship than what is revealed by this woman right here. In the whole New Testament, I think this is, this, she breaks every rule that there has ever been in, in, in coming before God. She just breaks every rule. She's like that person who is kneeling when everyone else is standing. She's lying, like, whatever it is, she's breaking every rule to say, I don't care what anyone else thinks or sees, I know I need him. And that's the picture that we get. So, the reason why Jesus tells his story is because when Simon looked upon this raw act of worship, he didn't see that. He didn't have the the gift of hindsight that we do. He didn't see a raw act of worship. He saw an immoral woman touching someone who was supposed to be holy. And in his mind, he thinks, well, this can't be a prophet Because if he was a prophet, he'd know who that is and there would be no contact allowed whatsoever. Jesus, interpreting Simon's thoughts, says, Simon, I'd like to talk to you about what's going on in your mind right now. And he says, sure, teacher, you go for it. Simon's very cocky. And he says, Simon, I want to tell you a story about a couple of people who both had debts One had a debt that was this big and one had a debt that was that big. And they both went before the person that they owed the debt to. And in that moment, the person that they owed the debt to said, I forgive your debts. And so the people obviously received the forgiveness. Their debt was canceled. And so Jesus says, Simon, in this story, why don't you tell me out of these two people, which one would have would have had the most gratitude? Which one would have been the most excited? Which one would have been the most set free? Which one would have been uh, had the greatest revelation of grace and mercy and so on? And, And Simon says, the obvious answer, well, the one who was forgiven the greater debt. And Jesus then famously says this phrase, paraphrased by me, those who have been forgiven much, love much. You familiar with it? Okay. The revelation here, is that we look at that and potentially interpret it as Simon being a Pharisee, someone who was in the elite sect of those who were following God according to the covenant that was made with Moses, the 613 laws. He was right on top of them, which meant he was way up here. But the immoral woman, well, she'd broken every law that was ever written. So she, on the, on the scale, was way down here. And so Simon and maybe many others, maybe even you at one point in your life, have thought, well, in comparison to them, they need a whole lot more forgiveness. Don't look at your neighbor. Because my life's nowhere near as messed up as theirs is. And so this could easily be the interpretation, but friend, that is not what Jesus 
wants us to see when he says those who have been forgiven much love much because here's the revelation. What is the punishment when you are unable to pay a debt? Well, friend, the revelation and the understanding that those hearing would have had is the punishment is the same. Whether my debt's this big or this big, the punishment is the same. If I can't pay the debt, then I am thrown into jail until I'm able to pay it off. And guess what? It's pretty hard to work off a debt when you're in prison. The revelation isn't this woman sinned a whole lot more, so this act of worship is reflective of someone who gets it, but Simon, you don't really need to get it because you've only sinned. Friend, that's not the revelation. The revelation is this. Do you and I understand that there is perfection and evil? Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? I don't mean to discourage you at all, but it's not perfection, good, not as good, mm, really need help, suffering, all bad, bad, worse, terrible, hideous. That's not how it goes. It goes perfection and evil. We are all in the same boat here, meaning the way we respond to God is as a direct revelation of what we know He has done for us. And you can place yourself in this story wherever you like. God, you've only forgiven me a little, so I only give this much. Or you can be as the woman, God, I know what you've done for me. And if it wasn't for you, my life would be in the pit forever. And because of that, I can't wait to break my, bro- my, 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 my most precious thing over your feet with my tears and wash them. Friend, when you know what God has done for you, that enables you to walk humbly with Him. This story isn't about going and, not this story, but this series isn't about going and doing. This series is about a revelation of what has been done for you. The more you know what God has done for you, the more you naturally respond to God in the way this woman has responded to him. How I understand a simple little takeaway and let it be the takeaway for the series How I understand my personal need for the grace of God will always determine the way I respond to God. If I know that Jesus paid a price for me that I could never pay, can you win your own righteousness? No, you can't. If I know that Jesus paid a price for me that I can never pay, then it makes total sense for me to say, as you paid my debt, so my life is given to you. I am indebted to you. And you know what Jesus says to that? He says, no, you're not. You're not indebted to me. You're free. You're free. He said to that woman, he didn't say, I expect you here at nine o'clock every every morning and at three o'clock every afternoon so you can repeat this process. He didn't. He finished the passage in verse 50, said, your sins are forgiven. He just set her free. And friend, that is us. When we live in the fullness of freedom for what Jesus has done for us, then we have the free will choice to say, you know what? Because I know what you've done for me. And here's this. When you get a revelation of what he's done for you, guess what? You love mercy. It becomes so easy to love mercy when you realize you're the recipient of it. You know when you don't love mercy? When someone else gets it and they deserve punishment. I don't like mercy then. But when I'm on the receiving end, oh please, I love it then. I really do. When you walk humbly with God, you fall in love with mercy. And when you genuinely fall in love with mercy, it becomes a very natural response to live your life so that others will receive it as well. And in the pursuit of justice, that's where it all comes from. I'll just finish with this thought. Team can come and join me and I'll hand over to the guys in the campuses in a moment. In Micah chapter 6, verse 6 or 7, one of those two, it it says, shall I give my own firstborn? It's interesting, isn't it? They ask the question, shall I give my firstborn for the transgression of my sin? 
And God says, no, don't do that. But that's exactly what I'm going to do. He gave his firstborn for the transgression of all of our sin so that we could live in the eternal freedom of walking with him. And all his request is, is that we would do that with a spirit of humility that simply recognises who we are and who he is so that we might genuinely treat others the same way that he has treated us. Lord, I thank you so much for your word to us today. Your word always meets us where we're at, but never leaves us where we're at. I thank you today for a deepening revelation in every heart right across our church, in Moree and in Grafton, in Northern Beaches, in Coffs Harbour, and soon to be in Yurunga. For those joining online, Lord, that we would be reminded today that it's never going to be about what we can do in this life. It's always going to be about what you have done for us. And so, Lord, we choose to see ourselves today not as Simon did, not really needing of forgiveness, but recognizing the forgiveness that you've already given to us. And, Lord, as this unnamed woman poured out her expression of worship on you, I pray that that would be the way we live for others, that our expression of love for you would be the experience that people in this world get to have through our lives, that every gift, every talent, every resource that you have given to Lifehouse Church and those who call it it home would be this desire to live an as-you-go life in the pursuit of justice, to be people who make things right. Because you have made us right, we live to make things as you intend them to be on this earth. And Lord, we recognize that we've got a short time here. We recognize that every gift, talent and ability and resource that we have, we're not taking any of it with us. This body will be laid to rest at some point. And Lord, we want to use this vessel and this time to do what you've put us on this earth to do as a co-laborer with you. Lord, I pray that everyone can walk out of their locations today knowing this, God's got a good plan for me. And that good plan is that I would walk with him. I would daily love the mercy that he's given to me and that I would live so that others might experience what I've discovered in him also. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask the Coffs Harbour people, if you stand with me, I'm going to hand it over to the hosts in every other location and, uh, and just encourage you. Let's be a people who walk in the plan and the purpose that God has for us, in humility, in loving mercy, and in doing the justice that He has for us. Come on here in Coffs. We're going to sing, take a moment of worship. Let's do that together today.